The Technique Series is brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching. Did you know that you can get 100% free form check from one of our expert strength coaches? Seriously, absolutely 100% free. No credit card needed, no questions asked. Just go to barbelllogic.com slash technique and sign up for the free Barbell Logic experience now. Do that right now and then enjoy the show. Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. We got Matt. Today we're going to talk about more diagnostic tools for uh, uh, coaching and fixing your your lifts. And we want to talk about the back angle in the squat today. Yeah. 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 So uh, this I started thinking about this because there was a discussion in the in the coaching academy that we run about what happens when somebody lifts the chest in the bottom of a squat. And the comment was yep. like, what, what's the actual, what's the big deal? What's going on there? And it slows down the acceleration of the bar. The bar slows down. We're like, how do you know that happens? The, the students were asking that. And so I started thinking through the, that problem. and Because we can see it happens. Well, we can see it happen, right? But I, again, you've got, these are students who are, who are trying to work through, you know, they're they don't entirely get it yet. Plus, they also want to like have any studies been shown like vol- like bar speed velocity on like a low bar squat versus a high bar squat or sort of a sort of a vertical back angle versus a horizontal more horizontal back angle. And, you and I did um, um, kind of play by play on right. a strength lifting meet yep. about a year ago. Yep. It's on YouTube somewhere. You can find it. You know, I've watched a whole bunch of reps at meets and watched them with you, but I've never sat down and talked through them in that way like we did that day. Sure. And I've watched a lot of this, and I'm a coach, and I'm very interested in it. But on that day, when you and I were actually talking through it live on YouTube like that, um, I mean, it proved it to me. Like the bar speed, you, you could see them. They'd lift their chest. It was a limit attempt. They'd lift their chest, and they'd fail. Or they'd lift their chest, and it would just the speed of the bar would just drop in half. You know, uh, yeah. you can just we just yeah. see it over and over and over again. But the real problem is, is then why is it happening? Yeah. So, so that's what got me thinking. So, you know, we we teach the squat, the low bar back squat, uh, where you early on in the squat, early in the descent, in the first third of the descent, you set your back angle and you set it pretty horizontal. Of course, it depends on anthropometry, right? So, the shorter backed and longer legged you are, the more horizontal you're going to be, and the longer torso you are, the the more vertical you're going to be, but everybody bends over to some degree in the descent on the squat, and that back angle should be set by about a third of the way down in the descent, and it yeah. holds. Somebody like Nikki Sims with the very, very long femurs, her back angle sets later than somebody with short femurs. Yeah, it just takes longer to bend over that much. Yep. But but even even she is, I mean, her back angle's there by halfway down. Halfway, for sure. Okay, so, and then if done correctly that back angle stays. So let's, let's say, let's say it's somebody like Nikki who sets her back angle or, or let's say it's a 45 degree angle. Let me be clear. It's not a 45 degree angle. We're not aiming for an angle, right? But for the purpose of this discussion, let's just say you bend over and you set your back at a 45 degree angle, then it should stay at that 45 degree angle all the way to the bottom of the squat. And for the first half to two thirds of the ascent of the concentric portion, Mm -hmm before the angle of the back starts to change and stand back up and become more vertical. That's, that's the model we teach. Now, here's the question. There are two ways to change a back angle incorrectly in a squat. You could make the back angle more horizontal as you come up out of the hole. Which I do. Or you could make the back angle more vertical out of the squat. Both are, both are wrong and both are, are a... A, uh, a waste or a loss of energy. And that's what I really want to talk about on this episode. So let's start with the first one. The first one's actually a little easier to understand. It's also the thing that, that we get accused of more often. It's the idea of the good morning squat. Mm-hmm. So you descend, you bend over, and you descend in your squat. And then as you come up, you drive your hips up, and you can see the back angle as the hips drive up become more horizontal, almost to the point that it's parallel to the floor. And then eventually the back has to come stand back up if you're going to actually complete the lift. 
And so we get accused a lot of like, that's the way we teach the squat. Well, it's not the way we teach the squat. We teach the squat to hold the backing. So the question is the squat morning, what the squat morning, that's correct. That's, and that's not the way we want to squat. Mm-hmm. What's the problem with squatting that way? Let, let's talk about it from a physics perspective and sort of muscular perspective. What, what are some of the primary problems with getting more bent over on the way up? Well, the, the knee extends and the hip ascends, but the bar goes nowhere. That's exactly right. Knees extend and the hips stay closed. Yeah, but they travel up. And so the knee, right. the, the hip angle is right. actually closing. It's a disaster. That's exactly right. That's right. So the hips stay closed or even become more closed as the knees extend and the bar doesn't move, or at least the bar moves less against gravity. It goes up less than the hips go up. Yeah. If the hip goes up more or faster than the bar does, we got a problem. Yeah, that's what normally happens. It's not that the shoulder doesn't move. It's right. It gets behind the, the hips. Shoulder moves, but a little bit, but doesn't it right. It's behind it. It it lags behind the hips. Now that said, for people who coach and for the coaches who are listening to me or people who watch many, many, many reps, almost everybody that actually utilizes correct hip drive actually does have a tiny little bit of back angle change. A tiny bit. I'm talking about a degree or two. Right. Because you can see the musculature around the hips fire up as they contract and that hip drive, the hips start to come up and the shoulders immediately catch up quickly. The bar catches up quickly to the hips. So there is a tiny little bit of change. It's literally a blink and you miss it. It's a blink and you miss it. Yeah. But if you can, if you video yourself or if you're a, if you're an online coaching client or coach and you, and you slow that video down in the bottom of your squat, you video from the side, especially, and you look at it sort of frame by frame and you get down to the bottom of the squat and you go, okay, and you stop the video and you go, all right, this is a pretty good position in the bottom of the squat. looks about right. Mid foot, knees aren't too far forward. I'm nice and bent over as I should be. And then you go forward a frame or two and you see the hips come up and the bar doesn't move or the hips come up and the bar just moves a tiny bit and the back angle becomes more horizontal. We got a problem because the musculature that causes the bar to go up or that should cause the bar to go up is still working, but the bar isn't going up. So we have an energy leak. That's a problem, right? And there's different ways that we could see that, but that's, that's the primary problem with that good morning squat. Now, when the back angle changes to become more horizontal or more like it's parallel to the ground, the moment arm actually gets, there's more moment on the back. That's the other Mm -hmm. problem. So now I have to, I went from having a sort of static amount of moment on the back with my back angle set. The only two things that can change moment force is segment length. So my back didn't get longer because the bar stayed in the same position unless you rolled the bar up your back, which happens sometimes. Or angle. Yeah. The more an angle is perpendicular to the gravity vector, the closer it is to horizontal, the more moment it has. So what I'm literally doing in a good morning squat is putting more moment on my back and I have to now overcome more forces to stand back up. I made it harder on myself than I had to. It's a double whammy. That's right. You've added the extra moment that you didn't need or want and your hip came up and nothing moved. That's right. That's so right. You, you actually have less muscle to use at that point to overcome more work. It's the same thing we see with people whose knees extend and their hips come up at the start of a deadlift and the bar doesn't break off the ground. That, that's it. That's wasted muscle contraction. The thing about the deadlift, though, that one's pretty easy to fix. The person who can't keep their chest up, well, you know, that's my problem. And it's, sure. it's really not a form problem. It's a, this guy can't do it problem. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sometimes it's just a, it's a, it's a weakness or that you can't, it's, it's like, a, we did the episode on knees coming in on valgus knees, you know, like yep. there's, Boy, I got people who are just, I know they know exactly what they're doing and they're working as hard as they can to beat it. And they just, no matter, once they get real heavy, the knees come in. Yeah. You just can't, you know. So, um, yeah. So, so that's, we've got, a, we've got some major energy leaks and um, we dramatically reduce our efficiency in the squat when our back angle becomes more horizontal in, in the squat out of the hole. I remember we, we want a general horizontal back. Because we want to work the musculature of the back. Yeah, let me stop there. It's not going. To, we don't want everybody's back to be horizontal. We just want you to be a little leaned over a bit. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, so you said when they lift the chest, the bar speed slows down at the opening of the show. You said that. Well, yep. 
when, when, when your shoulder gets behind the hips or the hips come up faster than the shoulder, the bar speed slows down as well. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So are we at the point where we talk about how to some cues to correct that? Or is that where we are here? Well, yeah. So if you're somebody who drives the hips up and the, and the bar doesn't come, what do we do? Like, what are some of those cues? And remember, sometimes we use cues that don't actually say what we want you to do, but it's a cue that gets you to move the way we want you to move. I've heard them all. Yeah, <laughs> being the guy. That, uh, so, what one are some of the things that one of, uh, said one of Matt Reynolds' favorite ones is uh, pretend there's a meat hook under your rib cage, pulling your chest up out of the hole. I have actually tried to lead with my chest. I wouldn't want many people to do that, but try to lead but with I, my I, chest. But I use that for people like you who have long legs and short torso. I say lead with the chest. Now, again, do I actually want them to lead with the chest? Nope. Nope, I just don't want the chest to fall behind. I don't have a chance in hell of doing yeah, that. Yeah, you can't do it anyway, <laughs> right? Nikki uh, Sims can't do it anyway. There's no way you guys can lead with the chest. So if you try to lead with the chest, it probably reduces the amount of lag behind mm -hmm. that the shoulders have behind the, behind the hips. Create distance between your feet and your shoulder. When yeah. You push off the floor to come up out of the squat. Push your your shoulder off the That's floor. Uh, that one, thinking yep. of that, helps me. Don't lean over. Right. Yeah, don't lean over. High bar squat. Yeah, because you're somebody, let, let's explain. So those both those cues are cues that really only work with people that have really long legs and a short torso. Yeah. The don't lean over. Like, people have really short torso, you're going to lean over. Matter of fact, I remember this. So I can remember being a, a strength coach at the high school I was at. This is in maybe 2006, somewhere in there. And so we were fully implementing squats and whatnot. And we had myself and one other guy who was a, who was a really good coach uh, in the in the weight room. And our kids were, you know, it was a, it was a good time. There were good times. There were, the atmosphere was good, and the kids were really into it, and they believed very much in in what myself and and Coach Gold was was were telling them about how to how to squat, how to lift. And uh, we had a kid who was about six two, and. His hip bones were like at my chest. Mm -hmm. It was bizarre how long leg, and he, and he was big kid. Kid was probably two forty, you know. Uh, wasn't wasn't stringy. Was a big De thick high school deadlift machine offensive line offensive line. Actually went to play college ball later, and I can remember the football coach, the head football coach, would scream at this kid for being too bent over on the squat. There is no way that kid can squat without being bent over on the squat, even if he high barred, even if he let his knees slide forward, like even if you front squatted, that guy's going to be bent over, right? Like it's just his just his femur was so long and his torso was so <laughs> short, there was just no way to do it. So I had to pull the coach aside. When of course he, you know, I would try to privately tell him so it didn't embarrass him, but he still wasn't very happy about being corrected. But you just can't do it. So for guys like that, and guys like you, and guys like Nikki Sims, guys like Nikki Sims, and ladies like Nikki Sims, humans like Nikki Sims. You can actually try to lead with the chest. You can think that. It's never going to happen. So it could be a, a nice corrective cue to use. It's just one of those sort of things we call an overcorrection cue. You, you'll never actually be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, I'll actually pull my head up a little bit. I don't look up to go up. Yeah. But, but looking down, like you would have, you know, a longer torsoed person sure. is not helpful for me. Sure. Um, <clears throat> here's one that if it's not necessarily an anthropometry or kyphosis back problem, I have found to be very, very useful. Slowing the descent. Yep. You know, that bar is 315 and it's headed down and it has a velocity of X. So momentum is the mass times the velocity. That's right. And if you can take some of that velocity off, there's not as much momentum at the bottom. So when you come to a stop at the bottom, your hip and the bar stop at the same time, and then they can both head back up at the same time. But if your hip, oftentimes I'll see somebody, they, they're going, they're dropping too fast yep. into the hole and the bar continues down and the hip is headed up all back up already. That's right. And it's just driving their chest into the floor. So yeah, for we, me, if I can stay slow, if I can, I want to be going, I mean, of course the bar speed goes to zero at the at bottom. The bottom. Sure. But I want it to be as close to zero for as long as I can get it yep. as I head towards the bottom. Yeah. I, with my, with my bad hips, I have been doing much more box squats lately. And I try to touch the box. I, si I fully sit on the box. The way I like to teach a box squat is not to use the box as a depth gauge and just, you know, tap it with your hamstrings and come back up. I sit on the box. 
but I sit on the box. I, I, I'll use this cue for people on box squats. I sit on it like a ninja. Like I try to make no noise mm. and touch it as softly as possible and then still let it take the majority of my weight. And I notice it's, it, I mean, look, a, a box squat will slow you down because if you hit it hard, we got some problems. You can, you know, right. You, you don't want to slam into a, into a box. And so mm. I, and I've noticed that the softer I touch that box, the less I rock back and rock forward to stand up, which if you watch the old like West Side videos, all these power lifters or box one, that's what they do. They use momentum. They touch the box, they rock backwards, and they rock forward and use the momentum of rocking forward to stand back up. Yep. They'll literally rock the barbell, but way behind their midfoot and then rock forward to stand up. And so slowing everything down, I think that's actually a great future episode for us. We just need to do an episode called Slow It Down. Yeah. One of the first things I do with people at, for online coaching is to slow the bar down. I go, we got to slow down the descent. The eccentric phase of all lifts should be done slow and under control for a long time. And the yep. concentric phase can be done as quickly as possible. Yeah, do it as Punch fast as you want. through the ceiling, right? <laughs> it's, it's still going to be slow. Do it as That's fast right. as you can. The only, yeah. the only exception to this rule is the eccentric phase of the deadlift. On the deadlift, we drop it pretty fast. Mm. It's sort of a controlled drop. I mean, it's controlled, so you're not actually driving. You definitely don't drop it. But um, for the squat, for the press, and for the bench press, for those three, that eccentric portion is I want to slow it down. Does that mean I'm reducing the amount of stretch reflex and rebound out of the bottom on those lifts? Yes, it, is, it does on some How? level. But it, only it, it, for it a short period of time, right? Because if it throws you out of your groove, if the bar hits the bottom and you got to catch it and you can see it jolt the body, well, then the rebound doesn't matter because you're rebounding and the bar jumps forward four inches, four inches in front of your midfoot. Right. So we slow the eccentric portion down. We control the weight. We can feel the midfoot on the squat. And then we fire back up and we try to maintain the back angle. By the way, a really good cue for, um, we're about to talk to the, about the other end of that spectrum, which is people who actually do lead with the chest. But much like the master cue of just stay on the midfoot is a great cue, maintain the back angle has been a pretty good cue for me. I tell people just hold your back angle. Right. Like don't change anything about your back angle. Right. That's actually a pretty good master cue for back angle as well, just to think about that. And a lot of people that really helps them Oh, 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 I'm not going to, I can feel the back angle in the bottom of the squat. Don't let it change. Mm -hmm. Don't bend over more. Don't lead with the chest. Just hold it. Just, you know, so it works pretty good. So let's talk about the other side. So, mm. because this is really where the discussion came from this morning. These lucky bastards. <laughs> right. If you, well, you, if you're uh, going to pick one of the, if you're like, you're going to have a problem, which one do you want? Yeah, sure. Lifting I the chest be long, early. long, short femur. <laughs> yeah. Way, way less moment. So for people who tend to do the other thing, which is they lead out of the hole with their chest. Let's go back to that discussion. They were like, well, does it actually slow the bar down? And the answer is yes, but the, the question is why, right? So does leading with the chest itself slow the bar down? Well, no. What's going on here is when the back angle, so let, let's pretend that the person descends with the correct back angle. You and I haven't talked about this yet. We did no show prep. No, we have no, as, no show as prep. As usual. So, so we, when, we, when we talked about the previous problem, we talk about the hip closes and the knee opens. Yep. Don't wait. I know what you're about to say. Don't just wait. You're about oh, to say what happens God. on this one, right? Uh, right. Let, look, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you say it. Give me a second. So let's say that the person descends correctly, which, by the way, mm -hmm. isn't typically the problem with your wife. Your wife actually descends with her back to vertical, right? Yeah. But if you descend correctly, and then if you come up out of the bottom of the hole, you lead with the chest. What's happening? What's happening with the knees and the hips? You were about the to say. The knees close. The knees get more closed yep. and the hips extend and the bar is not moving. That's right. The knees so, close and the hips open, but the bar doesn't move. Anytime we have a joint angle change, we want that to translate into movement in absolutely. the bar. When the, when the joint changes, the bar must move. And that goes for any lift. Any lift. That's exactly right. So otherwise, it's just it's a it's an energy loss, right? We're just yep. wasting energy. Uh, this is the problem with the wrist getting too far bent back in a press. You start mm. to press, the wrist bend back, the bar doesn't move, but the wrist went up. <laughs> but the There's one didn't. exception, and the, and that is in the bench press when we when we talk about that in that bench press show. Yep. Yep. I hope you're enjoying this episode in the technique series of the Barbell Logic Podcast. 
You know, at Barbell Logic, we believe that barbell-based strength training is literally for everyone. And that the only thing holding most people back from all the incredible benefits that come from it is good technique and consistency. And we can help with that too. And whether you're just getting started or you've been lifting for a while, it's difficult to know if you're performing the lifts correctly or if there's anything you can do to make your lifting better. We have tons of free resources online from basic how-to videos that'll get you lifting safely and efficiently right away to podcasts, articles, and videos that will help you troubleshoot common errors. All you have to do is visit barbelllogic.com slash technique to see our best technique-focused content in one place. And while you're at it, you can sign up for a consultation with a Barbell Logic coach. This is a free form check and a chance to ask an expert all your training-related questions. There's no reason you should be struggling to get started or to make progress. Check out barbelllogic.com slash technique for more information and sign up for the Barbell Logic experience. Again, it's 100% free. There's nothing better for your training than knowing you're lifting safely, training efficiently, and on the right track. All right, let's get back to the show. So I call leading with the chest. What will typically happen when somebody leads with the chest is not just leading with the chest. If they just lead with the chest and the bar moves up, we can discuss that actually might be okay. I've got arguments against it for the most musculature, right? But if you are high bar squatting, and you descend with a vertical back and you let the knees go forward and you lead with the chest and the bar moves. All right, man, that's just a high bar squat. That's a right. front squat. It's exactly the way we teach a front squat. There's nothing wrong with that. What's the problem with doing a, a standard low bar or somewhere in that ballpark back squat and leading with the chest? Well, it's not just the lead with the chest. It's that the knees almost always close and scoop forward. We'll go forward. They go forward. The hips go forward with it, and the hips open up. So the hips open, the knees close, both slide forward, the back becomes more vertical, and the bar doesn't move. Yeah. So now I had all this movement that occurred in my body that did not translate into the bar. That's a problem. In the front squat, the knee is more forward. Yes. And just like you said, rightly so. The thing is, when we descend... There's a distribution of to torque and moment but in front of and behind the midlines right. and all of these lifts, and that's fine. The deal is, though, when you come back up, we don't want the proportion of those moments in front and behind the midline to change. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to say it. So if the knee moves forward, the moment comes off of the hip, but it doesn't move the bar up. It just goes forward onto the knee. So we don't want, we don't want those proportions of uh, those relative distances for the knee and the hip uh, relative to the midline to change. The gravity vector. They should both yeah. be coming in. That's right. Yeah, so that's, the, that's the, the physics way of saying it. And then here's the layman's terms. No matter how you squat, your back angle shouldn't change. Right. At the, you're on a high bar squat that's a very vertical squat, the back angle should stay the same. If the back angle becomes more horizontal or more vertical, you lost energy in a high bar squat. If the back angle becomes more horizontal in a front squat, you lost, that's an energy leak. If on a low bar squat, the back angle becomes more horizontal or more vertical, that's an energy leak. And so the goal in squatting is that once the back angle is set on that first third of the descent, as it should be, it should stay. Mm. And on something like a front squat or a high bar squat, the back angle doesn't change much at all from the very second the knees and hips break. Because the back is pretty vertical standing. If you ever watch somebody with a standing straight up where their body's completely in compression, what we call completely in compression, their back isn't actually 100% vertical. They're Can leaning be. forward a little bit because the barbell is behind them on their back and the barbell has to be in their midfoot, which means there actually is some moment even when you stand all the way up, right? Because your chest is in front of the barbell and your ass is behind the barbell. And the barbell's over in the middle of your foot, even when you're standing straight up. Yeah. Nobody actually looks like olive oil standing literally perfectly <laughs> vertical with a bar on their back, right? That, right. That, doesn't, that doesn't happen. So, so for something like a front squat or somebody who's very short, femured, and long torso who's doing a high bar squat, you think about these guys who, that are um, world-class Olympic weightlifters, and a lot of times we'll hear this, like, well, I mean, those guys squat high bar and they're and they squat, you know, six sixty for triples. And one, 
they're world class. That's not you. They're genetic, but also they're built to squat that way. I mean, look, the reality is, is like for a guy Their like femurs that, are eight inches that's long. That's right. For a guy like that, the difference in the muscle mass used, you know, our, our three criteria of using the most muscle mass in the lift for a guy that's built with a really long torso and a really short femur. Hey, let me tell you a secret. It's just not a big difference in muscle mass between a high bar squat and a low bar squat. Right. Because they're going to look pretty close to the same. I know. I, just I had that Andrew, different. Andrew Jackson, one of Andrew Jackson's online coaching clients came and saw me last weekend. His name's Bobby. And he's about. Oh, I know him. That's a great guy. Five inches, five inches shorter than me. Yeah. And we sat on the bench and I, my eyes were at his armpit. Yeah. But, but like he's his, an Olympic weightlifter. Like, right. That's what he And does. I told him, I was like, dude, 550 squat here in a minute. Yeah, right. Like, like I mean, he's coming. It's coming. Just, you know, yeah, don't and, get the and flu why? and it's keep because working. Because the total moment on that guy's body on a squat. Yeah. Like, if that guy puts 405 on his back and you put 405 on your back, the amount of moment force on your whole body is significantly higher than his. Yeah. We can complain about that or we just be like, well, we just got to, like, you know. What are you going to do? The other thing is you've got a lot better leverage for deadlift than he does. He doesn't have a great yep. leverage for deadlift, but you know what he does have good leverage for the pulls for a clean and a snatch, because yep. the reason that a, a deadlift is tough for him and easy for you is because your hips have that, the, that, that angle, that fulcrum is real, real high. And, and you're able to reduce the moment on your back in a deadlift pretty quick because your back is pretty short. But My, for him, I'm, I'm way vertical. You're way it's ver the opposite. Right. And so I'm for, way vertical in the deadlift. That's right. And for him, because his torso is so long, he can actually keep a long moment arm in a clean and a snatch and stay out over the bar, keep his shoulders out over the bar as long as possible. Why does that matter in a snatch and a clean? Because I'm trying to use my back like a trebuchet, like the arm of a trebuchet. Well, you can't, you can't, you're not a trebuchet. You I know? can't crack the whip there. You can't crack the whip. There's no whip to crack, right? It's like trying to crack a whip with a little bitty short stick. So, yeah. So, and this one's way easier to fix, man. You know, the cues are much simpler. Um, I think that this one's more psychological than, yep. uh, than uh, physiological. Yep. It's just, you know, it, keep your chest pointed at the floor as you drive up. Drive, That's right. You know, chest down. Yep. Sometimes their eye gaze is not in the right spot. You change their eye gaze. Yeah, I put their eyes. Sometimes I put their eyes, like, down between their feet. Yep. Like, I'm like, look down between your toes. I'll throw my keys in the floor in front of them. Like, look at that, yep. you know, or, or something. In a, this is one sometimes, where I'll so use, sometimes just moving. Sorry, I was going to say, I'll, I'll use the cue of, of the pretend the bar is sitting on top of your butt. Cue works really well for, for guys like this, right? So, mm. especially if I'm in person coaching, I'll actually swat them right Yeah, or I'll there. actually yeah. touch them right underneath where the barbell is actually touching. I go, listen, the bar isn't here. The bar is down here, and I'll touch them on their sacrum right here. Th literally think about, pretend right now that the barbell is sitting on top of your ass. By the way, a lot of those people, most of those people, have some anterior pelvic tilt. It's a, it's a far higher percentage of that population. Do So, like, the bar actually could theoretically sit on top of their ass. I mean, not, mm -hmm. maybe not literally, but they, it's easier for them to picture than for a guy like you to picture. If I say the bar's sitting on top of your ass, like, well, I mean, you know. You're a, you're a question mark. Like, your back is a question mark. How would it sit on top of your, you know? Right. It's pretty easy for them to visualize those, and those are good cues to fix that. And sometimes, though, the cue for those people is like it would be for charity, which is you need to lean over. First thing. To initiate the thing. Like, the, yep. they're leading with their chest out of the hole because they never did lean over. So That's exactly right. So lean over. That's right. Yeah, charity, we've had to use things like box squats with her a lot to give her. I, I use box squat with her as a as sort of a safety net because i tell her i need you to bend over way more than you're comfortable with bending over and your natural inclination if there's not something underneath you to catch you is you know i'm gonna fall if i bend over that much by the way you're like bend over way more which is an extra five degrees yeah right it's not very much really seriously no, it's, it's, yeah. it's not very much yeah she's still you know, with, 30 degrees more vertical than you are yeah with bobby last weekend i had to kind of recalibrate my eye because bending over for that guy it's like nine degrees. Yeah, it's not very much. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes people that don't bend over aren't standing all the way up under yeah. the bar. Correct. When they're locked out, too. If you're leaned over under the bar at rest, we'll say, uh, to begin with, it's hard to set your back angle properly. Yep. 
So if you tell them, stand up, boom, let's get your hips up. under the Proud bar. Chest. Stand all the way up. Yep. There you go. Let's get it attention. Proud chest. Stand up. Get your hips under the bar. Okay. Now ask back, lean over. Sometimes that'll fix yep. it. Yep. Yeah, it's good. Um, it's normally not too hard to fix that one, though. I don't no, think. it's easier. It's an easier one to fix. But I think it's important to understand the discussion of why that matters, right? Especially for those of us who are yeah. trying to low bar squat and use the most muscle mass, is that when you actually lead with the chest, what's actually happening there is the knees are scooping forward, the knees are closing, the hips are opening, and the bar didn't move. So it's a whole bunch of movement, yeah. right? So the, the takeaway from this episode is... Oh, do you have any studies? I don't have any studies. <laughs> is that the takeaway huh. from the episode? No. In fact, I don't. But let me tell a story before yeah. we wrap it up. My father-in-law, just last night, he said, man, that fifth rep on the second set just... He said it just, it was just brutal. And I was actually in the house. I didn't see it. And I said, well, gosh, what happened? He said, well, I watched watch the video. I lifted my mm -hmm. chest. It's a breakthrough. He's never been yeah, able right. to do that. He's kind of a shorter yeah, torso yeah, guy yeah. too. And he's like, and he was, I think he was yeah, pleased. That's funny. <laughs> that he was actually yeah. able to do that. And I'm like, well, that's Yeah, that's every great. once in a while, these kind of overcorrection <laughs> cues actually work and overcorrect. Yeah. And then you got to swing them back the other yeah. way, right? So, um, you know, my wife never... She, she always would stay very vertical in her back and never shove her ass back. And I just kept ass back, ass back. And now she does the thing where she doesn't break at the knees at all until her ass has been shoved back two feet. I'm like, right. whoop, hold on. And she says, you've told me the whole time to shove my ass back. I'm like, I know, but now, now you're overdoing it. Right? it does, that does happen yeah. sometimes. So, yeah, the, the takeaway here is that regardless of what your problem is, if your problem is your back becoming more horizontal or your back becoming more vertical out of the hole, the goal is to maintain the back angle throughout. And that also applies to all types of squats, not just low bar squats, but it applies to high bar squats and front squats and box squats and all squats, right? And, and also, I would even go so far as to say that while lots of people might disagree with us about the way we like to squat, that I think, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody argue with the idea, like nobody should want to change the back angle in the middle of the squat. I don't know that I've ever heard an Olympic weightlifting coach say, you know, change the back angle, but mm -hmm. you know, like in the middle, like the back angle sets and it should hold because then as the hips and knees drive up, as they extend, it all goes into the barbell, right? We've seen other problems with people who have a, a weak torso or, you know, we don't like the word core, but a weak core where those things move and the, and the, and the core goes soft and there's an energy leak there. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking mm -hmm. about the core stays rigid and because the back angle turns to more horizontal and more vertical, it's an energy leak. So regardless of the type of squat you're doing or whether you have the problem with becoming more horizontal or more vertical, the goal is to maintain the back angle through the, through the bottom two-thirds of the descent and the first two-thirds of the ascent. Back angle stays the same. That's the goal. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. Don't let all the noise on the internet uh, mess you up. There are plenty of uh, examples of people doing their very best to do a low bar squat that are getting, you know, like, like me, they'll, you know, I do a squat morning, my best efforts a squat morning. And, uh, there's nothing I can do about that really. Cause my back, my back is so short. And then our friend Bobby, his is so long that he, yeah, uh, he squats the way he squats and, and it's, and yeah. they're both correct actually. Uh, and, and a lot of the attacks that you see on the internet are just people that just don't understand the differences in these body types. That's like exactly. the head coach that you were talking about earlier, he's yelling at a guy about his squat being messed up. Well, he could do no other. So hopefully that sheds a little light on anthropometry. What happens, um, what happens when the back ankle is wrong and how you might be able to correct it. Yeah. Thank you. That's pretty awesome. So now what do we need people to do? We need them to go to overcast or their favorite you know pod catcher and uh get a copy a uh, link to our show and send it to a couple of their friends that's what we really need and give us a give us a little boost and uh yep there is another show thanks for listening to the show and uh tell us if tell a friend like we asked that's the biggest help that you can give us thanks for listening we'll talk to you in a few days